Journey into space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. Jet Morgan, Steve Mitchell, Doc Matthews, and Lemmy Barnett are on their way to the moon. Shortly after takeoff, they lost contact with Earth and didn't regain it for 27 hours. Then, nearly two days later, a small meteor struck the ship and Jet Morgan, after putting on his spacesuit, went out through the airlock to inspect the damage. Fortunately, it was slight, but Jet was so awed by the sight of the universe around him that he asked Mitch and Lemmy to join him. Lemmy, impressed by the novelty of being able to walk right round the ship's exterior, wandered to the other side and out of sight of his companions. And then, strange sounds were heard over his radio. Immediately, Lemmy began to call to Jet and Mitch, but they didn't hear him. Then, as something like near panic took hold of Lemmy... Jet! Jet! The sound stopped, and Jet heard him. I heard it, I tell you. The same kind of music we heard when I got the radio working. Only this time, it was much louder. Like it was right inside me helmet. It was uncanny. Lemmy, if there had been any music, it must have been coming through your radio, and we'd have heard it too. But there was, I tell you. I was calling you when it first came on, but you didn't hear me till it stopped. Lemmy, lie on your bunk. You don't believe me, do you? None of you believe me. We do believe you, Lemmy. Now, come and lie down. You believe me, don't you, Doc? You heard that music coming over the radio, didn't you? I wasn't out there, Lemmy. I was here, in the ship. What's happening to him, Mitch? What do you think's happening to him? I told you, he's unstable. A psychological misfit. Oh, you're not going to bring that up again. If Lemmy says he heard a strange noise, he heard it. Then why didn't I hear it? Why didn't you or Doc? Doc wasn't outside. How could he? Well, he was listening to us, wasn't he, on the ship's receiver? That and our personal radios all work on identical frequencies. If there'd been anything to hear, at least one of us would have heard it. He must have imagined it. And be careful what you're implying, Mitch. What other explanation is there? Well, how should I know? Anything could happen out here, anything. Radios could play tricks. The ship's, Lemmy's, anybody's. Maybe there's some kind of radio wave we know nothing about that can only be heard out here in space. Ah, piffle. Oh, trouble with you, Mitch, is you won't believe in anything that can't be proved. All right, now break it up, you two. Lemmy's upset enough without you discussing him like he was a mental case. Yes, Doc, you're right. Trouble with this ship is room's so limited you can hardly keep your thoughts to yourself. Room or no room, Lemmy has still got to be discussed. What do you think about this, Doc? I don't know what to think, Jet. At first, I was inclined to agree with Mitch. Say, Lemmy's imagining things. And who could blame a man for that out here? But Lemmy's not that type. Besides, he says the sound was the same as we all heard just before we contacted base, remember? Yes, almost like music. Atmospherics. <laughs> what, on this equipment? It wasn't atmospherics, Mitch. That radio picked up something, no doubt about that. It was too strong, too pure to be atmospherics. You mean it might have been transmitted? Could have been. You'll be saying it came from the moon next. Uh, why not? There's no life on the moon. How do you know? Have you been there? Oh, for heaven's sake, Jet, what's got into you? Any elementary textbook on astronomy will prove there's no life on the moon. Will it also tell you what lies on the other side of the moon? Well, of course not. No man has ever seen it. <laughs> but how can it be any different from this side? It must be much the same. But you can't prove it, Mitch. And you can't explain the behavior of the radio. Being out of action for so long, then picking up those weird sounds just before control came through. Are you two trying to say that there's life, civilizations maybe, on other planets, even on the moon? We're not saying there is or there isn't. But you can't rule out the possibility. I can. I'll believe it when and if I see it. Until then, I'll be guided by the known facts that life on any planet other than Earth is most unlikely. Why should the Earth be singled out? Why should such a, an infinitesimally small part of the universe be unique? For the same reason that you are unique. Yeah. You are five foot nine inches tall, weigh 180 pounds, have gray eyes, and were born on the day you were, at the hour you were. You, everything about you, is a lucky combination of circumstances. No, I can't agree. Whether you agree or not is beside the point. Look, the question in hand at the moment is Lemmy. What are we going to do about him? What can we do? Oh, I can hear you. Well, for a start, we'll have to make a rule that he doesn't go outside the ship again. Well, there'll be no need for anyone to go outside again. The chances of another meteor hitting us are a million to one against. I don't mean while we're still coasting. I mean from now on, even after we've touched down on the moon. What? You, you mean you'd let him go all that way and then deny him the right even to step outside? Yes. Unless I can be 100% sure we won't get a repeat performance of what happened half an hour ago. I won't do it to him. Neither will I. But I tell you, Lemmy's unstable. I can still hear you. Anything might happen to him. 
He'll be seeing moon men next with one eye in the middle of their foreheads. Look, Mitch, you're being unreasonable. More than unreasonable. I just want to be sure that nothing wrecks this project. That's more important to you than anything. Or anyone, isn't it? You're darn right it is. Sorry, Mitch, but Lemmy carries on as was arranged. What happened outside is going to make no difference. All right. I'll consider myself overruled. If I listen to you too much longer, I'll think you've all gone crazy. Let's hope I never have to say I told you so. You won't. I'll guarantee it. 22nd October, 1965. It is now three Earth days, seven hours and six minutes since takeoff. The ship has now settled down to a regular routine. Lemmy seems to have fully recovered from whatever it was that scared him outside the ship, and now nobody even mentions it, though it's obviously preying on the minds of us all. Radio contact with Earth is clear and suffers from no interruption. There isn't much to do now. Every man takes his watch. Lemmy plays his mouth organ. Mitch studies his tables. Jet reads his book. And I keep this diary. Our speed is now very slow, not more than 50 miles an hour and dropping every second. Soon the most exciting, the most dangerous part of our journey will be on us. Uh, Lemmy. Yes, Jep? Stop that racket and listen, will you? Yes, Jep. Uh, everybody listen. We've now passed neutral gravitational point. The Earth no longer affects us. The moon has taken over and is pulling us down towards its surface. It's only 23,000 miles away now, and yeah. the time has come to turn the ship over. Uh, switch on the stern televiewer, Lemmy. Let's All take right. a look at the Earth. Televiewer, stern view, on. Hey, is that the Earth? That little thing? I hardly call it little, Doc. It fills the old screen. Stand by. OK, Mitch? OK, Jet. Doc? Yeah, OK. Lemmy? OK. Number one, gyro. Number one, contact. Watch the screen, Lemmy. Nothing happening yet. Oh, oh yes, now it is. Earth moving off screen. One degree, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. Any sign yet, Lemmy? Not yet. Oh yes, here she comes. Limb of the moon now visible, getting bigger. Blimey, the mountains and craters are as clear as anything. Well, never mind that, keep your mind on the job. Plus one, 1.5. Stand by, Doc. Two, yeah, whenever you two like. 2.5, plus three, 3.5, plus four. Number one, gyros, 3. cut. 5, plus five, 5.5, 5. 5. 5. 5. plus six. We're getting turned too far. 5. Stand by for counteraction. Plus seven. Number seven two, gyro. 5. Ready. Plus eight, 8.5, 8. 5. plus nine, 9.5, plus 10. Number two, contact. 10.5, plus 11. Stabilizer, stand by. Five. Standing by. Stabilizer, now. 10.5. 10. Dead on. Number two gyro, cut. Steady she goes. Okay, that's it. Now leave the stabilizer on for a while, let's be sure. Still steady, on course. Cut it, now doc. We're okay. Well, that's that. Easier than I thought. Let me call up base. Tell them the ship has been turned over and that we're now falling towards the moon. Uh How far now, Jet? A thousand miles. Getting close? Yes, very close, Mitch. Now, it's about time we began preparing for landing. Everybody, onto your couches and strap yourselves yeah, in. Sure yeah. thing, Jet. We're still dead on course. If there is a man on the moon, he's going to get a very big surprise soon. Landing area, spot on. Let's hope we don't hit her too hard. Yep, safety straps fastened. Me too. Safety straps, OK. Then position your control panels. Number one panel in position. Number two. Number three. Four, OK. Mitch, stabilizer. Stabilizer, ready. Contact. Lemmy, course. Spot on. Dock height. 930 miles. Shock absorbers ready. Yes, Jet. Let's hope they stand the concussion. They will. Contact. 910 miles. Still some way to fall yet. Now, let's all relax. Gravity conditions will return as soon as the motor is cut in. Now, don't let the shock take you by surprise. 900. Blimey, and it's jagged. We could have land on that mop. No, Lemmy, they're the mountains that surround the bay. Where we're landing is much smoother. Uh, better be. Height, 895. Landing area, still spot on. 890. Nearly there. Hope somebody's got the kettle on down there. I could just do with a cup. Here, what's that? What's what? Quiet, Lemmy. 880. But uh, I can... I what can is hear. it, Lemmy? 875. Nothing, Jet. It's the excitement. Lemmy, what's wrong? Uh, 
Nothing, nothing, I'll tell you. Take no note. 870. Stand by. I'm going to cut in the motor. Landing area spot on. Let me pull yourself together. 865. 860. 855. 850. Contact. Check. Check. Let me watch the screen for heaven's sake. 845. Landing area. Okay. 840. 835. Okay, Jet. Okay, Lemmy. Lemmy. Okay. Gentlemen, we're on the moon. Didn't you hear what Jet said? We've just landed on the moon. Doc, Lemmy. I heard him. Yeah, so did I. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Well, the way you're carrying on, he might have just announced your death sentence. Maybe he has. What's up, Doc? And Lemmy, what's worrying you? Nothing. Now out with it, Lemmy. You didn't hear that music again, did you? Leave me alone. Would you keep getting at me all the time? You did hear it, or at least you think you did. Am I right? Am I? Leave him alone, Mitch. In a minute, you'll be saying you heard that darn music, too. I'm not so sure that I didn't. What? You, Doc? I can't explain it, but just before the motor was switched on, I began to feel very strange... A sense of foreboding. With landing only a few minutes away, how else would you feel? No, it wasn't that. I didn't exactly hear anything, but... I know, you you just felt it. Yes. Yes, that's the only way I can explain it. Now you're both beginning to imagine things. Mitch, it was not imagination. Well, look, let's forget it for now. We've got work to do and little time in which to do it. Now, get up and we'll start. Yes, of course. Do we put our magnetized boots on? Uh, No, Lemmy, we won't need those till we return. Now, uh, switch on the main teleview and we'll see what it looks like outside. Televiewer on. Can't see a thing. Rotate the camera, full circle. Camera rotating. Oh, well, still nothing. If anything, that screen's getting darker. No sign of a picture. The camera's pointing towards the night side of the moon, and the sun's hardly rising yet. We, we can't expect anything on the screen. Well, not even the stars? Oh, we, we should see those, I must admit. Let's wait a bit. Wait till she's turned 180 degrees and begins to pick up the day side. Now, here she comes, getting brighter. But still no picture. It, it's like the lens is fogged over. <laughs> what are we worrying about? It, it's dust. What? Dust? Oh, of course. The moon's surface is covered with it. Volcanic ash, meteoric dust. The blast from our motor when we landed must have caused a regular dust storm. <laughs> we came down right in the middle of it. We won't see a thing. Let's settle again. <laughs> oh, you, you know, for a minute it had me scared. I, I thought the televiewer had packed in like the radio did. Me too. Well, while we're waiting, we'll get ready to go outside. Yes, yeah, And sure. not, not you, Lemmy. Hey? Somebody has to stay behind. Oh. We can't all go outside at once. Oh, for a minute I thought... Oh, you'd... don't worry. Next time out, somebody else will take a turn of staying behind. Well, that's fair enough. Now, call up control. Yes, sir. Mitch, Doc, get your suits on. Yes, yeah, sure, okay, right. Hello, Earth. Rocket ship Luna calling control. Come in, please. Stand by. I've got him, Jet. Hello. Hello, Earth. This is Jet Morgan. You can tell the world that rocket ship Luna has landed. She touched down in the Bay of Rainbows less than five minutes ago. No need to tell them, Jet. They just heard you announce it. Every major city on Earth is hooked up to your ship via radio. London, Sydney, Paris, Berlin, New York are hanging on to your every word. No, I mean, I'll be careful what you say, Jet. The whole world is listening. How was the landing? Fine. Came off beautifully. We hit the target area right smack in the middle. Was the trip a comfortable one or was it unpleasant? A bit cramped, but otherwise very comfortable. Ah, the televiewer screen's clearing. It's almost time for us to go outside. I'll arrange for our personal radios to be fed into the ship's transmitter so you'll be able to hear us talking. And now, if you'll excuse me... Now and the door is opening. In just a few seconds, we'll have our first close look at the moon's surface. 
And there it is. Good heavens. How does it strike you, Jeff? Any different from what you expected? No, not really, but it's so difficult to believe we're actually here. It's, it's so bleak. Not a tree, a blade of grass, nothing. Nothing but rocks, craters, cracks, and rugged mountains. And more rugged than anything you'd ever see on Earth. And the sky is black, an inky black. The sun, a brilliant globe. The barrenness is hard to believe. Not the slightest sign of life anywhere. Nothing but the rocks and dust glaring in the sun. And deep black shadows which are sharper and, and harder than any seen on Earth. And there's little variation in colour. It's almost a, a, well, a monochromatic world, like an old-fashioned sepia photograph. Except that instead of browns, the colours range from, oh, ash grey to, to dirty yellow. Can you see the Earth? No, we won't see it until we've left the ship and have climbed down onto the moon's surface. Uh, put out the ladder, Lemmy. We'll go down now. Ladder. Contact. How's that? Fine. All right, Doc. You first. No, Jet. Let Mitch go. Oh, no, Doc. We made a deal, remember? Yeah, I know we did, but I'd like it to be you just the same. But why? Look, without you, there'd be no ship, and none of us would be here. Now, get going before I change my mind again. Thanks, Doc. I won't forget this. Well, here I go. Oh, I, I feel so light and the going's so easy, I want to let go and float down. No, no, Mitch, don't take any risks. Take it easy. Well, I made it. How's it feel? Well, fine, except that I'm ankle deep in dust and, hey, be careful how you walk. The ground's full of cracks and mounds. I don't think there's a really flat spot anywhere. Down you go, Doc. I'll be right behind you. I can see the earth now, Jet. Come on, come and look. <laughs> Give us a chance to get down first. It, it's so easy to walk. Everything seems so light. I feel like Samson. Hello, Earth. We can see you now. A great ball in the sky, about oh, four times the size that the moon looks from the Earth. And like the moon, the Earth is passing through a phase. Less than half of it's illuminated. Can you make out the seas and the continents? Africa and Europe are facing us now. Most of northwest Europe appears to be covered in cloud. But the British Isles seems to be enjoying a spell of good weather. We can just make out the outline. The colours on the Earth are brilliant. Blue seas, green and brown land areas, yellow deserts and, and glaring white clouds. The colour contrast between the Earth and Moon is amazing. The Earth's a beautiful planet. Beautiful. Well, if you can see the British Isles, they should be able to see you. It's early evening in London and the Moon is high in the sky. Would you like to talk to them? Yes, very much. Very well. But before we go over, I'd better explain to our listeners that delay in replies between the Moon and the Earth is due to the Moon's distance from us, the time taken for radio waves to travel that distance. And now, over to London. Hello, Luna. London calling. Hello, London. Congratulations, Captain Morgan, to you and your crew on your wonderful achievement. Thank you. Hearing you talk to us and... Seeing the part of the world where you are situated looking so minute gives us a, a, a dreadful feeling of isolation, of utter loneliness. Then there is absolutely no life on the moon? Not that we found as yet. No unicorns or dragons or men with antennae sticking out of their foreheads? <laughs> we haven't noticed any. Supposing you met one jet, what would you do? Run for it. How's London? You'd hardly recognize it. Traffic is virtually at a standstill. Everybody who's not at home is crowding into radio shops or gathering round the street amplifiers to listen to this broadcast. Well, I never thought we'd stop the roar of London's traffic, not from a quarter of a million miles distance. Well, you have, Jet. The whole United Kingdom is with you up there, in spirit at least. And hundreds of people would like to be up there in fact, too. The telephone lines are jammed with callers trying to book seats for the next trip. What are the chances of that, Jet? How long before there'll be a regular passenger service to the moon? Well, Mitch is more qualified to answer that question than me. What do you think, Mitch? Oh, not for a long time. We'd have to make the moon habitable first, and it's anything but that right now. Is that the ultimate aim of this trip? To make the moon habitable for human beings? Well, in so much as a spaceway station on the moon will help us reach the other planets, yes. But it will be no more than a stepping off point to Mars or Venus. Colonization of the moon will be the task of our children or, or our grandchildren. 
Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. I hope anybody else who was thinking of telephoning us took that in. Well, we mustn't keep you because we know you have a lot to do. Yes, we have to unload our instruments and our cameras, and that'll take some time. And we can't stay outside too long. Well, before you leave us, would you mind telling us exactly what your work on the moon will entail? We'll be taking lots of photographs of the Earth, the sun, the sky, and the moon's surface. We'll also explore as much as possible of the terrain, at least to the limit of our visible horizon, which is about two miles. Even that is probably more than we can manage in one day. One day? Is that all the time you'll be spending up there? One lunar day. Now, that's equivalent to two weeks back home. We plan to return to Earth just before lunar nightfall. I see. Well, we have lots of messages here for you from all over the world. Can you take them? I'll take them, Jet, while I'm sitting in here. Might be one from Becky. All right, let me go ahead. Disconnect us from the main transmitter, but keep the intercom open. Intercom, over. Test, please. Hello, one, two, three, four. OK. And if you see any dragons, give a yell. I'll hear you. I won't be able to help you, but I'll hear you. Hello, Earth. Ready to take your messages. Over. Hello, Luna. Here's the first one from Downing Street. It reads, To Captain Morgan and crew aboard rocket ship Luna, your great achievement has inspired us all. It is now three Earth days since we landed on the moon. Everything is going well. At the moment, Jet, Mitch, and Lemmy are taking the photographs and digging out specimens of lunar soil to take back home with us. Up to now, we have found no evidence whatsoever that there is, or ever has been, any kind of life on the moon. It is a completely dead world. Time you went back, Mitch, and let Doc come out. OK, Jet. Lemmy and I will wait here. When he gets out, we'll continue towards the little crater a couple of hundred yards ahead. Right. Periodically, the voices of Mitch, Lemmy, and Jet come over the intercom as they talk to each other through their personal radios. Every word they say is recorded, for the construction of the spacesuits does not permit the wearers to write their observations. Lemmy is in high spirits. A few hours ago, he discovered that the low gravitational pull on this dead world allows him to jump fantastic heights. He cleared a rock formation of at least 20 feet and would have tried higher objects if Jet had not stopped him. The risk of accident is too great for that kind of game. Any damage to his spacesuit, a sudden leak and consequent drop of air pressure could mean almost instantaneous death. Hello, Doc. Mitch calling. Oh, hello, Mitch. Close the door and open up the airlock. I'm coming in. Yeah, hang on a minute. Main door closing. How are you doing? Same as usual. Photographs, surveys, specimens. Be glad to get indoors. It's hotter than an oven out there. <laughs> Airlock filling, stand by. If it gets much hotter, we won't be able to work. We'll have to pack it in. Air pressure maximum. You can remove your helmet now. Thanks, Doc. Hatch opening. goodness for a breath of cool air. Anything to report? No. Nope. What have you been doing with yourself? Oh, keeping up my diary. Maybe you should put your mind on modifying these space suits. Huh? Find some way of getting rid of the moisture. I'm ankle deep in perspiration. <laughs> Nothing much I can do about it now, Mitch. It'll have to wait till we get back home. Well, get down into the torture chamber and I'll let you out. Yeah, okay. Jet and Lemmy are waiting for you 200 yards north of the crater. Uh, think we'll find anything interesting in there? Well, maybe. Who can tell? With luck, we might find some of that minute plant life they told us to expect. <laughs> I doubt it. Okay, Mitch, you can close the hatch. I'm all set. Here comes the doc now, Jet. He took his time, didn't he? Hello, Doc. Ready for another digging session? Oh, is that what it's going to be? Uh, we'll take a few photographs of the crater first. Uh-huh. And then, if we can, climb down into it and see what the floor's made of. Right. Uh, pick up those tools, Lemmy. What? I'll take the camera. Uh, Doc, can you manage the surveying tackle? Oh, I can up here. Back on Earth, it would take three men my size just to lift it. Well, let's get going. We'll spend a couple of hours there and then go back to the ship for a meal. What? Hey! Hey, listen! Wait a minute! What is it, Lemmy? The music! It's here again! Yeah, steady, Lemmy. Good gracious. What is it, Jet? I don't know. 
S stand still, listen. You can hear it? I'm not sure. It, I, I can't exactly hear it. it. It was like, well, I don't know how to explain it. It stopped now. Wasn't exactly like last time. Not so loud, but just as creepy. It sends shivers down my spine. It scares me stiff. Did you hear it, Doc? Yes, Lemmy, I did, and it... Jet, the crater! Oh, oh quick! What is it, Doc? Didn't you see it? Something moved in there, I swear it did. Something moved? Yes. Oh, impossible. Did you see anything, Lemmy? No, Jet, I wasn't looking. Well, whatever it was, I only caught a glimpse of it, but it was there, I tell you. Lemmy, Doc, you wait here. I'll go and look. No, Jet. Oh, there is nothing on the moon that can move of its own free will. Then why can't we all go? No, Lemmy, you and Doc wait here. If it's all right, I'll tell you, then you can come on. Hello. Hello, Jet, what's the trouble? I wish we knew, Mitch. We heard that noise again. Not just Lemmy this time, all three of us. Did you hear it? No, I didn't. Are you sure you did? Of course I'm sure. And on top of that, I saw something move in the crater. Ridiculous. I tell you, I saw it, Mitch. Jet's hey, just gone hey, with... Hey, Doc! What? Where's Jet? What? Not a second ago, he was standing on that crater's rim. Now he's not. He must have fallen in. Hello, what? Jet. Jet, Doc calling. Can you hear me? Jet! Here. Yeah. He doesn't answer. Let's get over there. He must have hurt himself. Quick, if he's punctured his suit, he's as good as done for. Now, can you see him, Lemmy? He must be lying somewhere on the crater floor. No, Doc. There's no sign of him. The crate is empty. <laughs> You have been listening to episode two of Journey Into Space with Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by John Casabon and Alan Keith. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey Into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. <laughs> <laughs>